It was a four-story fall, from the top of the roof to the concrete pavement below. He had just passed his 29th birthday. We had been texting each other all day. His name was Tom, and he was my life. At the beginning of our relationship, Tom and I bonded over the many similarities we had. We both grew up listening to country music. Garth Brooks is our favorite country artist. And somehow we both agreed that the dance is our favorite country song. If there was ever a person to truly emulate the lyrics of this song, it was Tom. Holding, Holding you. I, I held everything. For a moment. For a moment. Wasn't I the king? But if at all known how the king would fall, they used to say, You know I might have changed it all. And now I'm glad I didn't know the way. Montana is probably not the easiest place to have a child grow up who is gay. Our community is, uh, you don't want to say backwoodsy, but you know, they're, they're rural and so they don't accept people who are different. The day Shane was born, I had to get a special leave from the hospital to go sign my divorce papers. So I was the talk of the hospital because we're a small little town and, and <laughs> that was kind of the, the special moment in my life. I think that, you know, they might have gotten married too soon, possibly, and they kind of just grew apart. My dad, he's a character. He was a wrestler in college, and he loves hunting. I would go hunting with my dad, and all of a sudden, after he'd shoot a deer, I would end up in tears, because I kept thinking Bambi. Like, my dad just shot Bambi. After a while, he stopped taking me hunting. I made a deal with my dad growing up that I would try all different sports. He tried baseball, he tried basketball, he tried them all. I remember one loss they had, and Shane hardly played at all, but boy, he took it hard, and that was pretty cute, but he wasn't much of a contributor. My first memory of Shane was at a school play, and he was just singing, dancing, whatever he could do to entertain, he was doing it. We had made a car. We used red glitter, and Shane wanted that car like none other. He was in fourth grade, and I remember him telling his teacher that when he graduated from high school, he's going to California. And I just thought, why is that, you know, that, that just seems so strange. I particularly remember him singing Barbra Streisand. He was running around the room in circles and singing right in everyone's face. You don't bring me flowers. Like just so charismatic and so unafraid. I was in elementary school and what I would do sometimes is I didn't want to go to bed. My mom would tell me to go to bed and then I would sneak out and sit behind her recliner and watch the TV because I wanted to kind of be a little rebel. One time she was watching the movie Philadelphia. Finally got to the end of the movie and I, I knew that this guy was gay and I knew that he was sick and he was dying because of being gay. 
And that really, it struck a chord with me because I knew that I was like him. That guy liked another guy, and look what happened. He kept getting thinner, he kept getting pale, and there was like sores on his face and his body. And I just remember thinking that that's, that's gonna be me, that's gonna happen to me. He got quieter, and he wasn't as fun to be around. You could tell that something was always on his mind, something was always bothering him, but you never knew what it was. One night, I remember Shane coming into my room, and he said, Mom, I'm dying of AIDS. And I said, Honey, wh why are you saying that? And he goes, Well, because of that movie. And I said, Well, honey, you, ha you don't have AIDS. And that's when I really noticed Shane starting to have panic attacks. He felt like he couldn't breathe. He would, and he would have to say, You've got to put a sack over your head. He didn't like doing it. But when he was at my house, we put a sack over his head. So as time went on, I would sneak into one of the bedrooms in our house and I would, I would dial 911 and tell them that I was dying. And all of a sudden I see these flashing lights in the driveway and I thought, what is going on? And I go upstairs and here is the ambulance saying that somebody was in distress in this home. Somebody was choking, somebody was suffocating. It led to her being like, you know, Shane, you know, God damn it, the cops are here again. From sixth grade till I got that kid through high school, I didn't know if I was gonna survive. I bet 10, 15 times he called 911. The money <laughs> that it you know, cost me through the years, it was just, uh, it was very stressful. But it was real to him, and I knew it was real to him, and I wanted him to feel he was safe. She finally decided that this is maybe more serious than she can handle, so she set me up with a therapist. When Shane got done with the session, he asked me to come in, and he said, your son just needs to admit to himself that he's gay and everything will be fine. And I said, how can you say that? He's not gay. And the Dr. Hauser said, well, you know, that's something you're gonna have to come to peace with. I always suspected, I'm not gonna lie to you, it took me a couple days to process and the thing it come down to is I ain't making any more kids. I better stay in good at the ones I got. And I love them unconditionally, so it, it, it just doesn't matter. It's kind of funny now that here I was, a little boy, on my knees praying to God that I wouldn't be gay. And there was another little boy 1,500 miles away in Indiana doing the same thing. Knox, Indiana is not the easiest place for a gay kid to grow up. It's very homogenous, not much diversity there. I knew Tom when both of our brothers were in Boy Scouts together. Everybody loved him. He was just the popular kid. He had a lot of empathy. I'll never forget the day my mom died Tom was the first person to come over to my house. He walked in the door and he was, you know, he was crying. You know, I almost thought he's sadder than I am. Tom's mother and father each had children from previous marriages. So Tom was the only child between the two parents and he was the center of attention in the family. He was the center of attention everywhere he was. Tom would always be playing the piano at home, singing, dancing around. He was doing his tricks on the trampoline. He was always performing. For Tom, there was never any such thing as too much. Tom's dad, he was a simple blue collar worker, came home late, got up really early the next day and you know did it again. And both of his parents sacrificed a lot for Tom's happiness. His mom took a job as a janitor so that Tom could go to Culver. Not many parents would do that, would start cleaning toilets so their son could have the best education. Tom's dad was in Vietnam, and that's why he, he went to Vietnam when he was in high school. He definitely respected his dad for, for fighting for his country. I think as Tom got older, as Tom became his own person, it just became difficult for them to connect. Tom was always very adamant about saying what he believed in, and it didn't work with his dad. And it's sad, but I really think that if more people would give me a chance to be their friend. I can show them that it's just because I'm not exactly like them that I'm still a good person. Welcome to Hi, how's it going? Oh, wait, <laughs> What? <laughs> I'm just coming to get the usual. Okay. <laughs> All right, thank you. It's kind of pathetic if they know exactly what I get every time. In Kalispell, seriously, there's tons of people at Dairy Queen. It's the cool place to be. 
Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't see. What the hell? She just closed the camera. Oh, there's. There's. Yeah. <laughs> there's oh, jeez, I closed the windows. Um, I actually worked here, but I wasn't. I didn't tell people that I worked here. I have to admit that I want to be one of those people that people are like, oh, you know, whoa, you look good. Because I enjoy running. But when I run, it's on a treadmill in our house because I do not want people to see me running. I do not want people to see me really at all. The one thing that I wanted was just someone that I could talk to and relate to that accepted me for being me. I developed a crush for a guy named Matt Parker. We would spend the night at each other's houses all the time. Uh, we would you know, play basketball outside. We were just best friends. It was in high school that I finally got the courage to tell Matt how I felt, and I wrote him a love letter. I was nervous, I was so nervous about giving him the letter, but he had to tell me that he's not gay, and it broke my heart, but at the same time, I was still so happy that he was willing to be my friend. There was a, a situation with a couple of friends in high school, and, and they were questioning his sexuality and kind of were, you know, mocking him, making fun of him, and a couple of his friends completely shunning him. I got a phone call from one of his best friend's mother, and she wanted me to come over. She was very upset. Once my mom told me that she was going over to Matt's house, I knew immediately this was not going to be good. It wasn't, you know, really love, love letter. It was just, you know, he admired Matt. He he enjoyed his time, and it was just, I thought, like a good friendship letter. It was nothing distasteful. It was nothing sexual. It was just telling him how he felt about him. I let her say everything she wanted to say, and after she was done, I just told her, I said, you'll never have to worry about this again because Shane will never be around Matt, and I don't want to ever hear from you again. I don't want to say what I really told her. It wasn't polite when I just told her, basically, take the flying leap and, and to leave my son alone. Matt's parents were very prominent in the community. His dad was a principal, his mom was a teacher. I was told by the principal that I wasn't allowed to go to any sporting events because Matt was on the teams. That was the big place to be. That was where everyone in town was, and Shane wasn't welcome. Matt was also in the same church community, and Shane wasn't able to go on a, a very important trip with his youth group. Matt's parents made it so he couldn't go, and he had raised all this money to go on this trip, and he was devastated. He acted like it was no big deal, but you could tell he was hurt. Once this letter came out, this boy and his parents went and shouted it to the world. Kids at school were constantly picking on him. He wasn't accepted anymore. They called him gay, they called him fag. Uh, the names that they called him were just horrendous. There's a mentality of the cowboy way, which does not include people that are gay. Um, so it's a tough place. Before he was banned, Shane was at a football game, and all these kids started spitting in this cup. And next thing I know, the one kid that used to be a real good friend of Shane's had this cup, and he's just about ready to tip it on Shane's head. And let me tell you, if you want to talk about a mother bear protecting her cub, this woman came unglued. I said, you put that damn cup down and leave him alone. It was just heartbreaking to see that happen to my son. It was after all the drama with Matt and his family that I just I went to a really dark place and I had a breakdown. I got a call from the school informing me my son has been in school for two weeks. Other kids made his life literally a living hell and it never really got better and I don't think he ever saw it would get better and that's why he just stopped going. One evening, all three daughters and I went to the furniture store and it was his birthday and he was by himself just hanging out with his mom. He was very depressed. He was not Shane. He was like a shell of himself. I was sick of the embarrassment and the pain that I was bringing to my family. I felt like the only way that I can make their lives better is by taking my own. I was at my dad's house. I was home alone. And I just walked over to his gun case and I took one of the guns and I just went back in the living room and I just sat there and I held it. I mean, there's so many thoughts like going through my head at that moment. It was like for over an hour, just really contemplating like what my next step should be. Fortunately, I also thought through in that it wouldn't be fair to my family, it wouldn't be fair to my mom. And I just had to visualize what the experience would be like for them if I did take my life. 
and it, it wouldn't be worth it. Also, on some level, I must have believed that somehow, someday, there's going to be someone out there who's going to love me for me. Tom just had this presence. He had this energy. He was always singing and laughing and enjoying life so much. There was a decorated general with a heart of gold. He was at the top of his class. He was a leader in all aspects of the of the word and in sports and in school. On the battlefield, he came. Every time you met Tom, it felt like you were meeting your best friend. And it didn't matter who you were. He always had your back. I think Tom went to Culver instead of the high school in his hometown because he saw it as an opportunity to open his horizons. And, you know, his parents played a big role in that. His mom worked at Culver primarily so that they could afford the reduced tuition so that Tom would have all of those opportunities. He came out to me our senior year. It was at night and we were sitting in the grass. And I remember he got really serious all of a sudden. And he said, I have something to tell you. I'm gay. And he put his head in his lap and he was crying and really emotional about it. I think he was really afraid of being judged. It didn't surprise me at all. This is coming from my friend who probably three or four weeks ago was singing I'm a Barbie girl while jumping on a trampoline in his backyard. He knew everybody and everybody knew him. I felt like my popularity scale rose just because uh, I hung out with him. Tom was friends with Anne Hathaway in school. He also was friends with Tom Hanks' daughter. I never could wrap my mind around it because here was Tom, this sort of Midwestern, corn-fed, American pie-eating guy who came from this tiny town in Indiana who then went to military school. He was able to get along and succeed in that entire social circle and academic circle, and then went to Vassar, which is this liberal place and a completely different vibe. He just sort of was magic. Tom, poor, as beautiful as he was, and you know, and the fact that he knew how beautiful he was, he did not care at all about how other people look. And he did not care where you came from, what car you drove. He just accepted anybody and everybody for who they were. And I think because he was gay and because he knew what it was like to be not the mainstream normal person, he told me many times how much he respected me because I was hearing a pair. What 20-something year old says to you, wow, you're amazing, you've done so much, I'm in total awe of you. Who, who says that? Nobody. Yes. He gave recitals of classical music. He wrote incredibly heartfelt lyrics, but he was tough because he could kick your ass. He could wrestle you down. I know that his dad was very stern. The idea of manhood and masculinity and presenting yourself in a certain way was important to him. I think he wanted to have Tom basically play that role. And Tom knew how to play it very well. There was definitely an unspoken understanding uh, between Tom and I that he was gay. And I know that was a struggle for him because he still hadn't told his parents. I think Tom was literally worried that his dad would kill him. Well, I'm leaving Calistar right now, and it's roughly 3 o'clock. And, yep, I am nervous. I've been talking to my family, and everyone's crying and doing that whole thing. I'm gonna be on my cell phone so it looks like I'm not talking to myself. Everyone gave me money and told me to be safe. So here I go. After graduation, he got a scholarship to go to the school here in town. And so it was hard, hired for me to not help him take it because he wanted to go to California. I knew when he went to Hollywood, he was going to be okay. And he could mix in with where a lot of gay people were. I didn't even know he went. <laughs> My mind is gone. I can't remember many things.
We first met Shane at a family wedding in Missoula, Montana. He said eventually I'd like to move to California. Well, three months later, we got a phone call from him that he was here. So we kind of tried to steer him, helping him get a job, a place to live, and we became like his adopted parents. I think he was barely 18 years old. He, this thin kid with curly hair out of Montana into the big city. He was very quiet, very reserved. He showed me some headshots that he took. He had wavy, wavy hair, and he looked oh, like Liberace. Right, right, right. And I thought, oh my god, right. what am I going to tell this kid? Shane said he wanted to be an actor. But after a very short time, it became clear he just wanted to get to California. I got a job working as a production assistant for a TV show. Shane and I met in the tape vault, and it was pretty much love at first sight. He's got that small town kind of quality to him. He's just so likable and funny and so humble. Shane doesn't necessarily see sort of what everyone else sees. One of my friends that I worked with, she invited me to go bowling with one of her friends. We had this idea that we had to get Tom and Shane to meet each other, but we didn't tell them that it was a setup. She said that there was gonna be this guy there named Tom and that he's active in the industry, so she thought that it maybe would be a good person to be connected with. We get there, he's ridiculously attractive, gorgeous, if you will, so charismatic, he was an actor. I think he'd been in a few things, and almost immediately, Shane became skeptical. He was like, who is this guy? And I'm like, why is he bothering you so much, Shane? He was four years older than me. Like, he traveled the world, you know, spoke a different language. He played a bunch of instruments. He was just so cocky and confident. And, well, of course, he, like, was bowling really well. And then here I am, like, can't even, like, knock five pins down. So it wasn't too long after we went bowling that we all got together again at my friend Lizzie's apartment. It was that night that we finally exchanged phone numbers. We ended up hanging out, you know, a few times here and there. He was always singing. He was always happy. Tom and I would spend all day together, and then he would go home which would lead to later in the evening talking on the phone for a few hours. It did not take long for me to really feel comfortable with Tom that I could tell him anything. Like, I trusted him with my life. Tom was a very confident person. <laughs> he went after Shane. My first Shane was like, ah, because he had never been in a relationship before, he, but this was his first you know, it was first love. We went to hear Tom one time, and Shane would look around the room while he was playing because he wanted to make sure Everyone everybody was paying, was paying attention and seeing what he saw. And there's a, a Jewish word called gvel, and that's what he looked like when Tom performed. He was gvelling, he was glowing. It was incredible to finally experience that feeling of love, you know, like the butterflies. It's what I'd always imagined that all my friends felt like. It didn't take long for me to move into his apartment. They got very close very quickly. I think their freedom wasn't moving to LA. I think Tom was definitely the door for Shane to come to terms with himself. But Tom was a safe place. When Tom met Shane, he was a little lost sheep. And Tom really looked out for Shane. He loved making dinner, even when he was really tired. He loved tying my ties, even properly tucking my shirt in, because at Culver, they teach you how to do all that. Tom truly was pursuing his dreams, and Shane knew that bills had to be paid. Shane was the level-headed one. What one couldn't think of, the other one could. They found an awful lot in common. They were both romantics. They're both from small towns. Both wanted to make a impression on the world. They were always smiling and always having a good time. And they're the kind of couple that makes you believe in love. Just I just, I loved their bickering, which was really flirting. That was probably my favorite part of their relationship. I did this once in military school. The kid had to shave his head. Oh, why are you telling me? Seriously, don't press so hard. They were like 
an old married couple. They were young, gay, but they never wanted to go out. I'm like, let's go to the bar, let's go to the club. They didn't go out a lot because they were always working, trying to build something. I know that for Tom, it wasn't just about fidelity, which of course was like number one. It was also about being completely emotionally available, uh, mentally available, spiritually available to Shane. When you get to my age, you start being a little agnostic that anything like that can occur. But over time, it became pretty apparent that this was something that was probably going to last for a very, very long time. There was an aura about them that just was something special. Everyone in this room or anyone watching this documentary could wish that they had the love that Tom and Shane had. That's what you dream about at night. And they had it. Shane and Tom started doing online promotion for um, musicians. They had a little tiny shack of a studio, but it was just so much fun. And we would just spend hours and hours just trying to think of ways to take over the world. All of a sudden, there was this factory of videos that started coming out. They had all these ideas for what could be a TV show uh, or a travel show. Hey, everybody, I'm Tom in the beautiful, extremely hot and humid city of Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Welcome to TomandShane.com. I'm Tom. And I'm Shane. And we're, we're in Oahu. Oahu. Why do you always do that voice? I don't know. That's not the pilot. No, 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 pilot. You do that voice. Well, I know. They became adventurers, filmmakers, documentarians. I think they just really liked the idea of taking the excitement that they had and sharing it. The more Tom and I fell in love, the more we wanted to tell our parents about it. But each of us had the philosophy that there was no need to tell your family until you found that person that you were going to spend the rest of your life with. So my mom and my aunt were visiting, and it was very late at night. But I, I told my mom that I had to talk to her. With Tom by my side, I said, Mom? I said, honey, if you're going to tell me you're gay, that's fine. I know it. And I'm with, OK with it. And I said, and is Tom your partner? And Tom goes, yep, I'm his partner. Tom was sitting there waiting for a big blow up or something. And I just said, well, great. I, you know, I don't have to worry about Shane like I did. Tom was my godsend. Shane didn't have his anxieties anymore. He was um, more confident. He was happy. He was just more of a man. I never imagined that I could love my mom even more than I did. She'd been there through all my struggles of being gay, and we never said out loud what the real deal was, but now we had. It was the greatest feeling ever. Just not roasting on an open fire. Tom and I knew it would be a challenge to come out to his parents. So he was in Indiana for Christmas. It was just him and his mom, and there was something that came on TV about a lesbian couple, and Tom's mom made a comment about how that was disgusting, and Tom, at that moment, just realized, like, I need to tell her. He told his mom, Mom, I'm gay. Like, when you say things like that, you're talking about me. He was, I think, sort of building on what had happened when Shane came out. Shane had come out to his mother, and she basically filled in the blanks. Oh, you're gay. I knew that. I always knew that. I was sure that his mom knew that he was gay, but she immediately called his dad to, to come home from work because of this breaking news. And she went on and on about how it was a sin and that Tom should have told them sooner so he could have gotten medical help. His dad said a lot of hateful things towards him and, and blamed Shane for making him gay. It's Shane's fault. Shane turned you gay. Um, being in L.A. turned you gay. All of your accomplishments so far being nothing now. They said, change your mind. You have to change your mind. And Tom said that he just kept saying, no, like, I, you know, I can't change my mind. It's not a, a mind change thing. Tom called me. He told me that his dad pulled a shotgun on him. And at that point, I, I was really scared. So while Tom and I were on the phone, his dad, Norman, literally ripped the door off the hinges. And his mom got on the phone, and she said to me, listen here, fucker. Um, I don't know what you did to our son, but we're going to come to LA. We're going to find you. 
I think the phrase his dad used was, he was gonna come out to California and gut him. I used to always have this fantasy of Tom and I going to Indiana uh, for Christmas and just, you know, going to bed and waking up on Christmas morning, all of us going out to the living room. You know, there's the tree and Tom and I just sitting there with his family, opening presents together and me just saying something that I think's funny and I look over and Tom's parents are laughing. Um, it's stupid, but it's just, you know, just, it would be like an incredible thing if something like that happened. When the police showed up at the house, Tom's dad just kind of poo-pooed it off. He said, ah, you know how these California kids are. Those phone calls for those next two days until Tom got out of there were just, uh, my heart just broke for both those boys. It was, it was just so scary and so sad. So that next morning, Tom's parents were in the kitchen with the Bible on the table. Out loud, they were saying the verses almost in a way just to justify that the day before, they beat up their son because he was gay. He's like, I can't believe this. I just got attacked and told that I should have taken the fact that I'm gay to the grave. Merry Christmas. It was just an awful situation. And Tom, you know, got out of there as soon as he could and flew back to California. To you. So, Eventually, Martha made her way out to California, and I was really, really nervous. This was like the first time that I was going to see Martha since that, you know, horrible experience. I think Martha came here because she did not want to lose her son, so she had to embrace Jane and act like she accepted the relationship. It was a little awkward for a while, but eventually, you know, we warmed up to each other. We would go to dinner. Tom and her would laugh like hysterically. When they get together, it's like two little old ladies. And although she didn't say like, you know, Shane, I'm sorry, or Tom, I'm sorry for, you know, how we handled everything, it was still just, to us, it was like, this is her way of showing that she's accepting us. It wasn't that she loved her son, she loved her son. And whatever it took to be near him, she did. If she had to push a plow, she would, just to be near her son. She has this picture where they went to, to Grumman's Theater and saw Elvis's handprints. She said that was the happiest day of her life. I think she truly enjoyed coming out to California. And then she would get back to Indiana and basically wouldn't acknowledge Tom's life here. And, you know, again, it was kind of like just baby steps. Truly, after like, you know, a few times we felt like, you know, she was okay with us and she was happy for us. She even insisted on Tom and me taking the bedroom while she stayed on the sofa with our dog. Justin, can't believe you. Look at me. How could you? Leave me all alone. Grandma's here and you just want to stay with her. You're such a traitor. Yeah, you put that head down. Tom was obsessed with this dog. Tom was always, always taking pictures of him. It was like someone was like a newborn baby. He was actually found abandoned under a car in Hollywood. Hi, Napoleon. How are you? He had a Santa Claus outfit, and he had some other crazy outfit. And I thought, oh my god, this is not going to be two gay boys with their gay little dog, is it? And sure enough, Pretty quick on Facebook, Tom was taking pictures of Justin Bobby in his little rain gear, and, and I thought, oh my God, you guys, come on, you gotta quit that. <laughs> so. Another dream that Tom and I had, aside from wanting to be married and have a family, was we wanted to travel the world together. And our goal was to hit all the wonders of the world and we managed to make it to four before Tom died. See the pyramids along the Nile. Watch the sunrise from a tropic isle. They enjoyed living. When they traveled together, that's what just amazed me, where they went to Egypt and, and to Peru and London and Paris. The way Tom and Shane were able to afford these trips is they're, first of all, very frugal. And not only did Shane work 
the job that he did for us. Tom would work, you know, get extra jobs doing, you know, commercials or whatever. So they could travel to all these places. And they didn't go first class. They would travel like they were students. The first trip I remember them taking was to Egypt down the Nile. But <laughs> it wasn't the kind of trip that I would have gone on. They slept on the deck with canvas dividers covered in blankets, and Tom caught pneumonia, but they had one heck of a good time. Tom and I reached a point where we were ready for him to come to Montana. You know, I kept talking about how beautiful Montana is. But for me, it was more about, you know, I was just excited for him to finally meet my entire family. My dad, all his life, was a logger. I mean, told gay jokes. Not the type of person that you could sit down and be like, hey, your son's gay. And he would take it easily. The uh, first time I ever met Tom, uh, I'd just been to town, and I'd seen my daughter's car in, in the driveway. So Shane and Tom jumped in the closet to hide, and, um, then my dad walks in and they both jump out of the closet like, surprise. And here's my boy and here's his uh, partner. And uh, it worked, they surprised me. And we just thought it was funnier in hell that they did that because it's like they came out of the closet at my dad's house. Tom, he knew I was a macho type guy and, and maybe I was gonna have the macho type uh, conservatism that wouldn't accept him. And you could just see he tried all the time around me. And I appreciate that, him trying, him trying to be likable. It was easy to like Tom. He was a great guy. Tom was a pistol. He was so much fun to be around. I saw that he made Shane laugh. It's the type of happiness you have when you meet your soulmate, and that made all my worries just disappear. So Tom and I went to Arizona to visit my grandparents. Shane was so happy. He was the happiest that I'd ever seen him since he was a little kid on up. And my great-grandma Pat was there. And no one told Grandma Pat that Tom and I were a couple. She was like, oh, nice to meet you. Um, and then later I heard her in the other room ask my grandma, Judy, like, so who was that guy? Well, I never knew Shane was gay, but I met his partner, and he was a very nice guy, and we all liked him and went along fine with it. Tom was fascinated with Grandma Pat for a few reasons. Um, you know, every year she keeps track of how many snakes she kills. Well... I'm always after a snake. I don't want them around. I mean, you killed up to how many at a, day? a spring, every spring? Oh, I killed up to 40 or better. After Tom and I went for a walk with um, both my grandmas, when we were coming back into the house, Grandma Pat like put her arm around Tom. She's like, welcome to the family. She's 90 years old, and you know she's accepting our relationship. People that talk about them, they don't understand a lot of it. And they think that if they go to church, and everything that God will take care of it. They can be just like all the rest of the guys. And so we can't get through to them. To tell you the truth, I'm tired of hearing about it. So they're not Romeo and Juliet. That's right, they're Romeo and Romeo, get over it. I did not like to show any public display of affection. Whether it would be us on a plane flying somewhere and we wanted to be affectionate, we would actually take a coat or a blanket and cover our arms and like hold hands under the blanket. Just don't make it hard. I think that Shane was very conscious of where they were and not making other people uncomfortable. I never really wanted to say I love you in front of friends or anyone. So we developed this little code. Whether we're at like a dinner or a party, one of us would find a way just to tap the table three times just to say, I love you. So that became a very special sound for both of us. Tom was just so passionate, and he was so affectionate. Sort of brought Shane out of his shell a little bit. As far as, you know, being out in public and not being ashamed or embarrassed that, you know, yeah, this is my partner and we're gay. So what? Once we were in Paris and we were in front of the Eiffel Tower, I just decided, like, screw it. I'm just gonna sneak in a kiss, and I did. But Tom's face, he was just like, like, what just happened? He was so excited. But then the first thing we did after the kiss, we, like, looked around, like, did anyone see us? Um, but I'm, I'm so happy that I did that, because he was just thrilled. Tom 
wanted wanted to marry Shane, but he wanted it to be legal. He wasn't going to settle for a technicality or a, oh, it happens to be legal right at this minute, but tomorrow it could not be. He was the kind of man that just stood up for things. And I think part of it was like he wanted to show everyone back home that I'm serious. This is me. He bought me a ring for Christmas and we had agreed to not spend any money on each other. He would tell me, but Shane's gonna get mad because we have a budget, but I just want to get it for him so bad. And I opened it and it was a ring with a note in it that said, 2011 will change our lives forever. Love, Tom. I had the image of their wedding played out in my head. I knew it was gonna happen someday. There was no question that they wanted to spend the rest of their lives together and have a family. That was something he wanted so bad. He used to say, you know, I'd love to have a little Thomas running around. Yeah, I guess one of the saddest parts when I really think about Shane and Tom is the fact that essentially they're living the American dream with the exception of being able to get married to each other. Well, everyone like brings up domestic partnership and, and it, it angers me in a way because no little girl is sitting in a room and saying that I can't wait to have a domestic partnership. I can't wait to wear a white dress during my domestic partnership. That's not something that that people dream about. They dream about getting married, and they weren't allowed to do that. And if it is ever illegal, they'll never be able to experience it because he's not here anymore. I was lucky to see Tom the Wednesday before he died. Getting closer to the edge, if I fall, will someone catch me? And we talked about you know, Shane, and he said, I learned what love really is. I used to have this idea in my head when I was young, and being with Shane, I've learned what it really looks like on a daily basis, and it's so much more than I ever thought possible. That's what the song's called, If I Fall. Even if I fall. <laughs> Thank you for that. Thank you for that. You're welcome. All right, so there you go. If I fall, are we agreeing? That's what we're gonna call the song, all right. The thing that haunts me now is we had a fight that morning. Originally, we were supposed to hang out with our friend Alex and go take photographs together. And after our little argument, I decided that I would just stay home. Tom and I decided to meet at the studio, and we kept going back and forth. And he's like, let's go to your place. I, I just remember the sunlight in the kitchen. I, I need some of that sunlight now. And I was like, OK. He was like, no, I want to do something good for you. Let's do a photo shoot. It had turned this day around. So I had just started dating this man, and it was his birthday, and it, we, I wasn't with him. So Tom was like, I want to make him jealous. So let's put pictures of you on Facebook. And he was the one that was like, let's do it, let's do it. Hey, can I do your hair? I was like, um, OK. <laughs> and I have, you know, my brazier filled with socks, because, you know, there's just not much there. So Tom and I were texting throughout the day, and we eventually made up. It wasn't even a discussion whether or not to go to the roof because we always went to the roof. And we told each other that we love each other. And I'm so thankful that we did because I have that forever now. And so by the time we get up to the roof, um, Tom has his camera, he's all ready. We'd all been up there like 50 times. And every time I'm just paranoid because it's not like a, a tall wall, it's a short wall. He just playing around with the camera. And meanwhile, I know that he had just been texting with Shane. I told him to stay away from the edge, because we all know that he's a klutz. And he even wrote back, he's like, ha ha, I will. Like, I was joking. And I, I said, Tom, I'm serious. Like, stay away from the edge. So he, um, he takes a bunch of pictures. But I'm trying to be as slutty and as, you know, not sexy, because it wasn't sexy. Um, I'm in one corner, and then we suddenly switch. And um, he's like, I've got it, I've got it. So he takes like three or four steps back. I don't think we registered that he was going to fall. He was like, oh, and I was like, oh, you know, and I, and I looked at him, and it was like we both thought, oh, no, Shane's going to be so mad. You know, just like, you know, if he knew that we were that close. And then after that, it was a nightmare. I, um, I didn't even go look over the edge, so I just, like, tore my shoes off, ran downstairs. I had my phone in my back pocket, and I dialed 911, but I couldn't hear. 
So I just give it to somebody out in the hallway because people heard him. I received a text from Alex to tell me that Tom had fallen. And I, I thought it was a joke. There's no way this is real. So I texted her back and I said, that's not funny. And then I didn't hear back from her. And so then I called Tom's phone and no one picked up. So at that moment is when like my heart just started racing. And by the time I get there, he's on you know, his stomach and I'm rubbing his back. I'm saying, it's okay, Tommy, it's okay, Tommy. Meanwhile, I look like a total hooker. Um, but it takes forever for the ambulance to get there. I want to say 25 minutes later, they were like, do you have his ID? Do you have his ID? I was like, what the fuck does it matter? Just get him on the ambulance. So I got to the ER, and they took me into a room where Alex was, and she was hysterical. When I first saw Shane, I said, I wish you were me. <sighs> I said, because you two have each other and the love you have is so strong, I wish it had been me, fellow. I asked her, you know, well, what's happening? Are they working on him? I, I didn't know anything. She didn't know anything. We hugged, you know, and we said we, we loved each other. And, um, you know, we're still hanging on to hope that he was okay. I tried calling Shane and I couldn't get through to him. And um, finally, he calls me back. He said, Mom, Tom was doing a photo shoot, and he fell off the roof. And I just, oh, my God. I said, honey, just keep on praying. He'll be fine. You know, we'll get the prayers going here. I got a text message from Shane saying, Michaela, please pray. Tom's hurt. And I immediately got down and started praying. So a little bit later, he calls me, and, and he says, Mom, they, they won't let me in to see him. And. I said, well, how come? And they said, because I'm not family. And I just, oh my God, Shane. So I called Tom's mom and it's, you know, late at night in Indiana. And, uh, you know, the first thing she says was, well, how much was he drinking, Shane? And, um, and then his dad in the background said, well, what the hell was he doing on the roof? And I just, but from that point forward, I made sure to let the nursing staff or the doctors speak to her and to him. And it had been probably about an hour later, the, the doctor came into the room and like, I just, I knew. Like I knew what he was gonna say. And when he, when he was talking, like it just, it wasn't registering in my head. Like I wasn't processing what he said. He just said he didn't make it. I mean, it was very, you know, and um, we all just lost it. Well, I had to just leave the room because I couldn't hear it. Alex was crying and she was continually doing this. I think she was just so traumatized. And Alex's mom was saying, oh my God, oh my God. And sometimes she would say, oh, his mother. Like, because Mother's Day was the next day. So I went outside. I called my mom and And I was like, Mom, like, he died. And, you know, she just said, like, I'm so sorry, Shane. Like, I'm so sorry. And he's just crying, and I'm crying. And, you know, here you are again, 1,500 miles away, and you can't be there for your child. And I got a hold of him, and Tom had just died on the, uh, in the hospital. And I don't know, it's not a moment I want to re ever go through again. The worst pain I have ever felt in my heart. Like, it just, I I just sunk. I just said, are you, are you fucking kidding me? Seriously? I, I said, seriously, who dies like that? I figured Shane was probably there when he passed, by his bed, holding his hand, and he said no. So I went to the nurse's station and I said, you know, my friend's boyfriend is here. He just passed away. Can you take him back? And she said, we can't allow non-family members to see him until his parents arrive. So I kept trying to argue with this nurse. And the lady was like, I understand, honey, I do, but it's against the hospital rules. He's not his family. I said, but he is his family. They have a house together. They have a business together. They have a dog together. They've been together for six years. Finally, we were sitting in a room, and this one nurse opened the door, 
And she said, is Shane in here? And so we went outside. She was holding Tom's license. And she said, man, he was a good looking guy. Jeez, I mean, all the nurses back here are talking about how handsome he was. And we've been working back here to try to kind of make him look the way that you remember him. Come with me, and we're going to take you back. I think at the end of the day, the nurses knew, you know, it's not a gay thing. It's not a straight thing. It's a human thing. But it was definitely a, a gift, I think, that those women gave to Shane. So they walked me back to his room. There was tubes all over his body, tubes coming out of his chest. His face was covered, but you could see that there, you know, had been blood, like, all around his face. And it didn't really seem like this was happening. I just stood there for a while. I didn't know what to do. The only place that I could put my hand was, like, on his leg. And I did, you know, one final tap, tap, tap. And fell to his death from a four-story apartment building in Los Feliz last night. Police say he was taking pictures of a woman. They don't suspect foul play and are calling his death a tragic accident. He was an actor and TV host. The days after Tom passed away are, are kind of a blur. There was nothing I wanted more than just to have my family there with me. And so it really meant a lot that my parents, although they're divorced, that they were able to just say, look, like we're going to be there for you and my sisters were going to as well. My dad and I, we went to go pick up Tom's car at Alex's place. And during the car ride home, we talked about me being gay for the first time. I wanted him to know, even though I had never said anything since he'd come out, that I fully accepted him. I think we even talked about how Tom's dad must feel because Tom's dad never accepted Tom and I wanted it to be known that I accepted my son. For the first time ever, I didn't care about telling my dad that I was gay. I didn't care about acknowledging that Tom and I were in a relationship. I just, I felt like fearless, but it didn't matter anymore. And Tom was gone. So I picked Martha up from the airport and we went to our house. She wanted to talk about bank accounts, all these things that I, I did not want to talk about. I remember her looking around the rooms a lot. And I didn't really want to think that way. I had the feeling that she just wanted to go through his stuff. She wanted to go through all the Shane and Tom's clothes. He let her go through all the drawers. She tried to take the computers. That was Shane and Tom's. It, it's just like Shane didn't exist anymore. Shane was more than willing to work with her, give her anything she wanted of Tom's, but 
it, it, it started to invade his privacy and he wouldn't say anything. Martha would make a comment about something and Shane would just stuff the emotions away. Like back when kids would call him names. I couldn't say anything anyway. I had no legal right to stop her. So Tom's mom was waiting along with us for the coroner to release his body. Due to the circumstances of the accident, they had to do an autopsy. We started talking about the funeral. And she said that, no, we're all invited. We're, you know, we can stay at their house, you know, come as a family. We'll, we'll just do all this together. She was very, you know, you know, I'm taking my baby home. You guys are all coming with. I want you to be there. And then as the days go on, she pretty much quit talking about the funeral and about us all going and, and sharing, you know, Tom with everybody back east. Tom's mom was in the other room or even sometimes right next to me making the funeral arrangements and planning it all out and I I was not a part of it. It was like I wasn't there. It was like I was a ghost. She was a mother who just lost her son, her 20-something year old son, so there were no expectations other than grief. But I didn't think that she was going to hurt Shane. I thought that she loved Shane. The feeling I got was something was awry but nobody could put their finger on it. And then that Thursday morning, Martha's like, I gotta go. And Shane's like, I'll drive you to the airport. She's like, no, I'll get a taxi. I told her, like, I'm not gonna let you take a taxi. I, I kind of had a, a feeling that she knew something that I didn't know, that she knew that his body was gonna be released any moment. She was packing all Tom's clothes up that she was gonna bury him in. And the jacket that she wanted to put him in was not fitting in the suitcase. And Shane's like, it's okay, Martha, I'll just bring it. And she's like, no, absolutely not. So maybe looking back now, it could have been foreshadowing what could have happened, that she knew then that she wasn't going to let Shane come to the funeral. I dropped her off, and we hugged. And I asked her to please keep me updated so I know what's happening. And she promised me that she would. But I never heard from her again. She was so grateful and so loving towards us for everything that we did for her son. She just was crying and hugging us and holding on to us. And I want to be a part of your life. I want to come visit. It was like we were bonded with her. And then the next day, she was gone. I talked to Tom's mom the day after he died. And she said, I'll let you know as soon as I know when the funeral is going to be so that you can be there. And then it was pretty much radio silence. They never called me back to tell me when it was, and I was very hurt. I see the notice on the newspaper, wake is this day, funeral's the next day. I called Tom's house to verify, and you know the, the relative who answered just said, if that's what the paper says, then I would probably go by that. And I personally called back to different mortuaries in his hometown to try to get information, and nobody would give us any information. So although I never heard from Martha. My mom and Alex and I, we all booked our plane tickets. During a layover, I received a phone call from one of Tom's relatives, and she wanted to let me know that I wasn't welcome to attend his funeral, because if I do show up, his uncle and his father had planned an attack. And she wanted me to know that it's for my own safety that I don't go. All I could think of is, are they going to shoot him? Are they going to kill my son? When we got into Indiana, one of Tom's best friends picked us up, and Alex was hysterical. And the closer we got to Knox, the, the more hysterical she got. And she was saying, I lost Tom. I don't want to lose you also. I was terrified that they were going to come and put out a gun on Shane. And I remember him saying more than once, you know, they're in a lot of pain. It's not just me that's going through this and almost arguing for them, which was maddening. I mean, I'd be angry. You're not going to do this to me. Nope, he didn't respond that way. We had a secret location to kind of come up with a plan about, you know, just kind of staying out of their way. And even though I couldn't be in the church, like I wanted to be as close as I could to Tom, just being near was somehow comforting. Once I realized that Shane had been banned from attending the funeral, I realized that's why they weren't telling anybody when things were. They basically were keeping all the information close hold so that Shane couldn't get there. In the blink of an eye, everything has changed. 
there were probably 800 people there. Half of them were there to support Tom, and the other half were there to support Martha. If I could have one more day, I'd spend it all with you. If I the casket was in the middle, and it was draped with a Culver blanket and all of his Culver accomplishments, and, and his mom was wearing his Culver ring. But I think it was very reflective of the family and how they viewed Tom, and not the Tom that I knew. When I got out to Martha, all I could think in my head was, I have to kiss the casket for Shane. And I made my way over to the casket, and I kissed it, and I whispered, you know, Shane loves you. The funeral depicted Tom up until the point where he left for California, basically. And the speakers were all from Tom's childhood. You know, it was his piano teacher and people from Culver. I took the flowers from the bouquet that the class of 2000 sent, and I dried them so I could give those to Shane. And I saved him a program because, you know, he's the love of Tom's life. He at least deserves that. Unfortunately, he wasn't mentioned in it. Families for literally 30 years can sweep that secret under the rug until someone dies, and then you have to really face the music. And I think that's what happened to Tom's parents. They had this great child. He was smart and talented, lots of positive things. But the one positive thing that they, they didn't want to brag to their friends about is that Tom had an amazing partner because they were ashamed. And so what they did is they literally erased it from the history books by shutting down his Facebook page, by disinviting Shane to the funeral. They're not even mentioning him there, which is the most insulting thing anyone could ever do to a person's memory. They're not fighting against gay marriage. They're not fighting against having a gay son. What they're fighting against is love. And who fights against love? When we came back, we decided to have our own memorial to celebrate who Tom was. Shane included pictures of his family, even though they hadn't reciprocated. Shane had pictures there with Tom's mom and dad and brother and sister. He brought people from Vassar, brought people from Culver, and his friends in California. Everybody was there. Even though a lot of us, maybe we weren't super close and barely know each other, somehow, that same guy was all of our best friend. Young, beautiful boy, I wrote Beautiful Boy, and the line about Tom making his way up to the Golden Doors as an answer to the fundamentalist Christians out there who may believe that gay people won't go to heaven. And to that, I would say, really, Tom, the choir singing, trophy-winning, all-American boy who listed God as his hero on his MySpace page, really in hell? I don't think so. If Tom didn't go to heaven, then nobody is going to heaven. If you believe in angels, Tom was as close to that as would ever come in a human form. He had no darkness in him whatsoever. He was the uber-positive one. So everybody was really nervous about how Shane was going to be, you know, post this horrible traumatic loss. I, I stayed with Shane after Tom passed away for a month. I told Shane, I'll stay here as long as you need me. But getting on that plane was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. You know, I, you don't want to leave him because he was fragile. Hey, Tom. Um, this is happening. Is this really happening? To all those people that um, say that gay people are unable to love, and I ask every single husband and wife that is in love to just to just feel what I'm feeling. Even, even for 10 minutes and, um, but really, I, I don't wish this upon anybody. I don't. I finally bought you your ring. <laughs> I'm sorry that I didn't, I didn't get you one sooner. I put tap, tap, tap inside, um, 
One thing that I've been thinking about is like, well, you know, what would have our relationship been like if we wouldn't have had to have hit it from the beginning? And would I have been able to just be more affectionate and just give you more love and who we are and how we, you know, loved each other is a sin. And that we have to live, you know, eternity, like just suffering because of this. I don't think God would purposely set us up to live a life of just constantly fighting the urge to be who we are and um, I really don't want to believe that. Happy birthday to you. You know there's a part of me that thinks maybe I should tell someone or maybe I should show someone you know how I'm really feeling instead of just telling everyone I'm okay and I'm not okay. <laughs> It's sad that it took losing you to see what's really important in life. All that really counts is just loving as much as we can, not, you know, being afraid to be loved. Before I was not eating enough, and then now, all I want to do is eat everything. Fat stuff, ice cream, pancakes, Red vine. Today, I am going on a plane to see the Taj Mahal, the great monument to love, which was next on our list. Going to the Taj Mahal on Christmas, Christmas Day is a pretty cool thing. So, Merry Christmas. I just wish that all of us humans understood that we're all the same. Everyone in the world, all different types of people, all different religions, like we all just want to be happy. We all just want to be loved. So thank you, Tom. Thank you for loving me and thank you for giving me the last years of your life. I feel like that's my responsibility, like my duty now, to try to live life like you did. A few months later, I went back to Indiana. I felt like I just needed to see Tom's grave one more time. I still can't believe like, how much has happened since that first Christmas, when we were each getting on a plane, heading home, and we finally told each other how we felt. When I got to the cemetery, I was surprised to see that Tom's parents had bought him a monument with a place for themselves, not next to each other, but on either side of their son. As though they're still trying to keep him from something or someone. It's just, it's hard to believe that even now, Tom is still being denied the promise of his own name. It really does feel like he's standing in for all of us now. I mean, like, for all gay people who dream of getting married someday. I guess I'll never understand why the ones who are supposed to love him the most fight the hardest to keep him from being who he was. Maybe the greatest thing about Tom is how much he loved them anyway. I just remember standing there and thinking, if there's one thing that I could say to his parents, here's what it would be. 
This is not the monument to your son. He was the monument to you. Baggots. To the sound of silence, the cars were cutting like knives in a fist fight. And I found you with a bottle of wine, your head in the curtains, and heart like the 4th of July. You swore and said, We are not, we are not shining stars. This I know, I never said we are. Though I've never been through hell like that I've closed enough windows to know you can never look back If you're lost in a long Or you're sinking like a stone Carry on May your past be the sound of your feet upon the ground Carry on An article came out in the paper, and then we had it on our, our news channels. And it was hard for several of my family members to see uh, my son on there with his gay partner. Uh, it didn't bother me, but it bothered a lot of people. I ignore it, because I'm proud of what Shane's doing, and because I'll always be grateful for Tom and what he gave to my son. Many times he said, you know, my life is not worth living without Tom. He's risen like a phoenix from the ashes. Shane is the guy who was afraid of coming out and accepting who I was, and now he's in front of the parade with rainbow flags behind him. 
I made something positive out of it, which is always Tom's motto. Shane gave discrimination against gays a beautiful, unforgettable face, and that face was Tom. <laughs>